talk about these paranormal things, Sasquatch, UFOs, ghosts. We get a lot of listener feedback, which is why I wanted to talk to you. Because you've got a, a new documentary coming out called Northern Lights. Great name, by the way. Uh, but this one focuses on UFOs in the region. We, we, we appreciate the work because there's, there's a lot of people that are interested in all this kind of stuff. So it's good that somebody's trying to piece it all together for us. Dee McCulley, thanks for calling in this morning, man. How you doing? Morning, how are you? I'm doing fast. into the Great War on September 17, 1914. A man was awoken late one night by a strange sound. He rose from his bed and went out to see what the commotion was. The sound filling the sky seemed to originate from Mount McKay. As he watched, an odd light seemed to silhouette the mountain time and time again. It was an average September night, clear, cool and quiet. Surprisingly, there seemed to be no one else hearing this droning sound. Soon the source of the flashes was revealed. An airship drifted over Mount McKay, shining a light all over the country, as if searching for something. Or somebody. The man watched for 20 minutes as it explored both Fort William and Port Arthur. Finally, it made a navigational change and headed southwest to Kekebeka Falls, and it was never seen again. The sighting made the paper. Surprisingly, not one person in the city saw the craft, or at least no reports were made. In terms of technology of the time, a man could only describe the sound he heard as the whirring of machinery. In that time, mysterious scare ships had been reported since 1896 and subsided for a time until a rash of new sightings began. They were observed in Britain, New Zealand, and America, but no one knew of their origin. Each nation blaming the other and was taken as a harbinger of war. Was it an airplane? The first airplanes had been in use since the Kitty Hawk flight of 1903, and the first blimps or airships were in use since 1852 and could definitely be a possibility. Even at that, Certain laws were set in place during wartime that there were to be no aircraft flying within 10 miles of a wireless communication system during the war. Whatever it was would soon cause a sensation with the public. Was it a dream? Oddly enough, the paper took it very seriously and wrote the article as a matter of obligation to Canadian security. 14 days after the sensational article, Hundreds of enthused stargazers were given the chance to see it as well. The object was seen once again, this time hovering over Mel McKay in full view of hundreds of people. Some hopped onto streetcars making their way to West Fort for a closer look. As they made their way, the object disappeared into the night sky. The Daily Chronicle refuted the sighting as being a glow from a residence. Sightings such as these first reports to local papers did not seem to cause a panic, but rather enthused many curious people who began scanning the skies for unidentified flying objects and unexplained aerial phenomena. A history of incidents in the Thunder Bay region has uncovered more than 200 sightings since 1914, encompassing distant encounters in the night sky to close encounters of the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth kind. Reports have come from historical newspapers, online reports, eyewitness testimony, and secondary testimony going unreported until now. It is well understood by the filmmaker that there are many, many more choosing to remain silent about the phenomenon. The sightings catalogued are as follows. 16 incidents with no details, 101 distant sightings, also including multiple viewings on the same nights, 61 encounters at 150 meters or less, one evidential as burns, three encounters with seeing occupants, three incidents of either missing time or attempted abductions, and one incident of being under direct influence of a being of advanced intelligence. Who are they? 
What do they want? Where do they come from? Why are they here? With so many sightings, it may be time for one to question everything they know as a reality. It seems there is something going on in northwestern Ontario, the Thunder Bay District in particular. It should be said that where there is population, both great and small, there will be sightings. Where there are sightings, there will also be misidentification. But it also must be stated, where there are sightings, there are also confirmations. Multiple witnesses from civilian to those in authority to those in the media that there is a reality of strange anomalous sightings in the sky beyond the controlled perception of reality stemming back hundreds if not thousands of years into learned native beliefs bordering into physics thousands of years before understanding and development of the field of over 200 sightings in the district some stories stand out beyond distant encounters on January 10th, 1915, 7 o'clock in the evening, a Van Norman Street resident saw an object flying over the wireless station high atop the hill. The sighting lasted several minutes as he made calls to the staff who seemed completely disinterested in the event. Was the operator receiving the call put under direct influence of the craft? The wartime rule was, it is unlawful for an aeroplane or any form of airship to travel within 10 miles of any Canadian wireless station in these times of war. And this law was broken, yet the operator did nothing to raise a finger to go look outside above his station. The man described the object as being all lighted up and had two large fan-shaped wings. He made repeated calls and finally made his way to the militia where soldiers dressed in red made their way up the hill to investigate. They spent several hours scanning the skies, but by that time, saw nothing. Um, well, let's start, I'll start with, uh, I first started really getting interested in aliens from a really young age. I was 10 years old and I remember I was in Kekebeka at my grandparents' house and, uh, I was kind of hiding behind one of the couches. They were watching a documentary on um, blackout files, right? The government files where they black out the lines they don't want the public to know about. And they brought up um, an event in the region that I think most people would remember as the green sky storm. When the, the sky in Thunder Bay and the surrounding area turned green, the, we had like funnel clouds for the first time. Really scary kind of storm. And in the documentary, they were talking about uh, radar showing there were UFOs flying over the clouds during that storm. In the only surviving footage from the city, on July 4th, 1999, a completely peaceful day was quickly turned into complete chaos. Within minutes, a large black cloud overtook the city and surrounding area, as high winds began to whip through at a recorded speed of 71 miles per hour and an estimated 100 miles per hour on the lake. Next, thousands of people watched the sky begin to turn green as the clouds began to roll over in an eerie fashion. city of Thunder Bay has a collective memory of the green sky storm, which ravaged it mercilessly. Trees snapped. Heavy rain and hail dumped so fast, water spouts couldn't keep up. Lawn furniture, barbecues, pools and the like flew multiple yards over, and many vehicles were damaged by debris. During the storm, a funnel cloud was also spotted in the West Fort area. 
the streets and parks were quickly devoid of any human life as people whisked their children away, running for cover and buckled down in fear, as if the end of the world was upon them. People hid in their homes and cars, trying to escape the chaotic onslaught. Some were even scared to look through the windows at the chilling scene. One woman recalls saying, it was a completely normal day and suddenly, it was like a bomb went off. It took several days to recover from the storm as people collected their belongings and made claims to their respective insurance companies. Damaged homes, damaged belongings, damaged psyches. The storm left the vivid memory impressed onto the minds of those who experienced it. Like a nightmare one could not forget. Every person who endured the storm of July 4th, 1999 has a story, and one would do well to listen, as it was not one to be trifled with. talking about uh, radar showing there were UFOs flying over the clouds during that storm. So as a 10 year old, that really like freaked me out. I didn't sleep for two or three days after that, right? So fast forward about two years, um, I'm at my cousin's house, again, rural, not quite Kekebeka -Ke far, uh, but far enough that when you look at the sky, you can see everything, right? Just fantastic view. And uh, it was my cousin, his dad, myself and my dad and we were having a fire and just looking up at the sky and we saw these two stars or at least they were indistinguishable from the other stars and they came from opposite ends and they were coming right for each other and we thought there's going to be a collision we're going to see this explosion in the sky right uh, but just at the last minute before they hit each other they both shot out in perfect 90 degree angles and we're watching these things and they're flying around and they're going around in circles and it's like they're playing chicken with each other right and we thought that's really strange and it goes on for about 10 minutes and we're trying to reason with ourselves like what that's got to be a satellite that like, must be programmed to not collide or something um but then one of them took off in an opposite direction and just left and we saw another one come from a different angle of the sky and it jumped in and it started with the other one and it goes they almost get to each other and they break out into 90 degree angles circle around do it all over again went on for about a solid 20 minutes and then they all broke off went in opposite directions didn't see anything else after that no sound we couldn't see them it was nighttime they looked like stars we had no idea so ever since then i've had a feeling that you know there's there's something there's things out there we don't know about man so that would be my first story um we can go ahead a couple more years i was about 17 ish uh, heading out Highway 1117, going out towards Kekebeka with my sister. And um, as we're driving down the highway, we could see this distorted kind of black haze in the sky. And uh, I don't know if that's even the best way to describe it. You know how in a movie when something is invisible and it shows it, you, you can't see the object but it distorts the view? It was kind of like that and we drove underneath it and neither of us said anything to each other and just a couple minutes passed and i turned to my sister and i said you saw that right like there was something in the sky there and she said yeah i didn't say anything because i thought my eyes were playing tricks on me uh so that got us really excited and i went home and i remember i was looking it up online and trying to figure out like what causes that and there was a couple of theories about groups of bugs uh flying in one spot of the sky and it's just i've done that drive tens of thousands of times in my life I've never seen that except for that one time and neither of us knew and again my sister has done that drive never seen anything like that before and uh, so it spooked us a little bit and we have no answers so those are my two stories not uh, I haven't seen anything physically in front of me but again I don't know and I don't know that anybody's been able to explain any of this stuff to me
Perfect. There was no light at all, and that's what I'm saying. It looks like an invisible object floating in the sky right above the highway. What color was it? Uh, it it kind of looked like it was outlined in black, but again, it looked like something was trying to hide, something invisible. What's your stance on UFOs? Like, do you believe they're military craft, or do you believe they're some unearthly origin? It's hard to say. Um, I would lean more towards military craft because I believe that the government has experimented with, with things. It's where the technology comes from. I don't know if they're creating it as something else come here and they've, they've worked off of that. But I mean, I don't believe anybody has the real answer to that right now. In the 1960s, a man was teaching a woman to use standard transmission and they decided to head towards the Cameron Falls Dam. Upon reaching one of the straight stretches, they pulled over and changed seats. Before touching any of the car's components, the car inexplicably shut off. The man asked what she did. The woman said she didn't touch anything. The man had survived the London Blitz and had been through several major battles in World War II and even chose to stay until 1947. He knew the sounds of war. He got out and tried to start the car to no avail. He looked under the hood when he suddenly heard what he described as the familiar sound of a buzz bomb. Without warning, the two were overshadowed by a massive craft drifting overhead. In shock and frightened, he jumped in the car with the woman trying vigorously to start the engine as it passed over the treetops. Suddenly, the car started and they fled. In speaking with one man, he believes the craft are steadily observing our technology, including hydro dams. One cold spring night about 3 a.m., a man was working on a feller buncher in the Poly Lake area, while his mechanic waited outside for any problems that may arise. Suddenly, the man in the machine was abruptly stopped by hurried raps on his door. He opened it to find the mechanic, usually well composed, described as a very tough man in nature, scared white as he pointed west asking, what's that over there? The two stood on the tracks of the machine watching as a white light hovered over Cameron Falls hydro generating station as the light shot up in the sky and back down to the treetops. The light would intermittently blink out as it shot from place to place. They finished the job, but would never forget what they saw. In June of 1977, in the 600 row of Castle Green, at about 5 o'clock p.m., several witnesses saw a craft in the sky described as a 40 to 60 foot object, 5 to 6 kilometers in the air, shaped much like an iron without a handle. They watched as it seemed to be mimicking a cloud formation by reflection. It moved into the open blue, changing its color to camouflage itself once again. Whatever it was could not completely hide itself, as highlights could still be made out. Word spread immediately of the object, as more witnesses totaling about 12 to 15 people came out to see the spectacle. The craft was said to move like a beach ball on water, drifting through the sky. Soon it ramped up its speed, reaching the south end of the city. Next, it let out an incredible five-second flash of light. Smoke billowed out the back in a trail as it headed out to Lake Superior and was never seen again. When I was eight, what you call it, me and my mom and her boyfriend were coming home uh, from Thunder Bay. We were doing grocery shopping, I remember now. And then, yeah, the, we noticed these bright, bright lights coming from the tree line, like maybe about 10, 15 feet above the tree line. And then there was four of them uh, and two of them were looking in the, like they were surveying the area almost and then the two they came up above us and then one of them went down on us and then uh, we got out of the truck and then they were gone where was this uh, it was dark where we were I couldn't even, can't even think of it is it, it was, towards Rocky Bay or towards Thunder Bay it was or? just past nipping on this side towards Rocky Bay oh okay it was kind of close to home actually think about it and then it, that was the last thing I seen of those lights that was though I haven't seen anything crazy like that ever since but then when I was 10 at home me and my mom and her uh, uh, boyfriend were, were making our new deck 
and it was getting laid out. So we took a, we went inside, went in for uh, did it, I ate lunch, and then came outside. It was getting a little bit darker out. I I started looking at the stars, and then I noticed this one bright star, and I and I went inside to show my mom, point at it. It was gone. And then I noticed it on the other side of the sky, and it was slowly going down. And when I showed it to her, she she noticed it, so she ran inside to get her boyfriend. And then when she showed it here, and I, I told her it disappeared, mom. It it's gone. I, and then I noticed on the other side of the sky, and then we all we all saw it. It, it moved a little bit, and then it, it it got dimmer and dimmer, and then it just vanished. And that was here in Rocky Bay. Yeah. The last UFO thing I just remembered was I was nine. We, um, I was playing at Rocket Bay here, and I noticed uh, above this mountain right here behind us, there was a silver, I noticed a silver disc, it was raining at daylight, a silver disc hovering there for a while, and then when I tried to show my buddies, it just, it like, it just vanished. Just clicked off. Yeah, it just, it, it was there, it didn't move or nothing, it just vanished, like, like, it didn't, you didn't see it move anywhere at all, it just, like, it, it like, it activated its cloaking ability, like, yep. if they have, if they are able to do that. Yep. And, like... I was just like, okay, like that, that got me, and I tried to try, try tell everyone that I saw it right there, and like no one believed me because it wasn't there no more. It was a hot August afternoon outside the small reservation of Gull Bay, Ontario, in 1958. A child waited with his mother while his father helped the man with a broken down truck on the roadside. The sky was clear, in fact, there was barely a breeze to be felt. As they sat waiting, he describes that everyone began to look around in wonder as they heard the sound of rushing wind, yet there was no change in the lifeless breeze. They all began to ask, what is that? It lasted seconds before their eyes were directed to the treetops. It was completely black and windowless. The sighting lasted about 20 seconds as it exploded in a burst of speed toward the reservation. He said his parents nor the man ever mentioned the sighting, not even to each other, as if they'd witnessed something they weren't supposed to see, almost in a reverent fear. In the early 1950s in Fort William, a technician in the Cam Power Building on Marion Syndicate said they had a complete power down of the station and couldn't figure out the cause. There was absolutely no reason for this, so they went outside to the transformer yard to investigate, and there they witnessed a large silver craft hovering over the transformers. It sat several minutes before it finally shot off, restoring the power to Fort William instantaneously. Whatever this was could interrupt and control the flow of electricity. Could it be the craft harvested power from the station? Or could it be they halted the power to see what would happen? We can only speculate on its motive. Back in 1946, a trapper and line staker in Beardmore, Ontario was checking on his trap line deep in the woods when he came across something mysterious. It was a year prior to the Roswell crash. A year prior to the term flying saucer. Yet the man described the same type of craft that national headlines would a year later. As he walked through the woods, he began seeing something metallic resting in a small clearing. After getting over the immediate shock of seeing such a sight, his intrigue got the better of him. He made his way over for a good look. After several minutes, he finally decided to reach out and touch the hull. While running his hands over the smooth surface, the craft suddenly activated, resulting in immediate burns to his hands, which left them scarred for life. It was never said what happened after that, whether he ran or it took off in front of him, but his hands would forever be a reminder of that fateful day. In uh, the year 2012, in October 22nd, and uh, it happened at the same time the hurricane was going through New York City. Uh, the first night we saw an object, it was silver with orange, round, and had like a sort of a dome on top of it. It came from behind a star and dropped down, came towards us, over us, and then it went to the right, 
and it went that way to uh, to the right. It went up and disappeared. That was the first night. We didn't have our camera with us. It was inside the house at the time. So we thought maybe there was a plane crash or something on fire or something. So we phoned the airport in Thunder Bay. And they said they had several other reports of people saying that, that they seen the same thing. And then the next night, I saw 10 of them coming, one after the other. And they came the same in the same format from behind a star and dropped down. And they come over us and they were going to the right again. They did the same path. And uh, they were traveling the same way. Same shapes, same colors, everything. There was no noise. There was no uh, sound of any kind. No smoke. No flashing lights. Just a silver object with the orange and yellow mix. And they were flying the same pattern. And they went up into the sky and disappeared. One after the other. I asked you one time about uh, why do you think they're here? I figured they're here because of silver, but you said something else. They're after uranium, I figure. They're looking for fuel sources. Do you believe this area is uranium rich? Yeah, it's under the water, underneath the, the lakes and the rivers around here. That would explain why uh, there's a few stories where you hear of the UFOs diving into the lake, into mm -hmm. Lake Superior. Yeah. Possibly looking for fuel. They're not military because they don't act like military and they don't like anything from this world because their characteristics are so different than ours. Uh, we woke up at three and we were both wide awake. And I said, well, let's go for a walk. It's beautiful, clear night, gorgeous. So we walked down Newton Street to the old, towards the old mill and above, we could see above the trees to the river um, from one point because the road goes down and there was this light and it looked like a helicopter like when the helicopters come over the river it was about that high off the water and it was like a spotlight yellowy and so we kind of watched it and it was moving around and all of a sudden it turned right pointed right at us and it like zoomed it just got huge right at us there was no sound no smoke nothing and it zoomed right <laughs> and we went okay so we turned around and just walked home by the time we got it was not very far not even a quarter mile by the time we got back to the driveway we turned and looked and we couldn't see anything but this thing didn't just stay at that one level it went up higher and then it zoomed in on us like that. And I, we don't know of any flying apparatus that can run with no sound. In Nipigon, Ontario, in the fall of 1948, a man had awoken one morning to see a strange craft floating over Nipigon Bay above the town of Red Rock. He quickly scrambled for his camera and took eight photos in quick succession. By the time the sixth photo was taken, the craft had traveled a straight shot of seven kilometers and was now above Nippigan. In his eighth photo, he captured a clear image of the craft over what locals refer to as the bald spot, located on the hill covering the west side of town. The man dropped the photos off at Thompson's drugstore for developing. Soon he had the photos in hand where his family and some friends could not believe what they were seeing. The man's son called his neighbor over to have a look, and she described photo number eight as the clearest to be a saucer shape with an upside down cup on top, looking much like the craft seen in the Phantom comic book. She also describes that there were circular dots for windows all the way around the part of the cup that touched the saucer. The next day, she saw her neighbor's son in school, and he said that the RCMP came and took the photos and the negatives. In learning more about this, it is said that the RCMP did not get involved with UFOs until much later, and it is believed that it was the RCAF who came and confiscated the photography. I had wondered how this could happen, and so quickly. In asking, I was told that the photos had made the news, and the authorities came in the middle of the night and ransacked the home. Whether this is true, I don't know. 
but the fact is the photos are now missing and have not been seen in 70 years. In the late summer of 1960, a couple picking berries at Duckbill Lake near Anacoke in Ontario heard a loud humming sound emitting from beyond the hill. It was such a strange sound they needed to investigate its source. They made their way over to the top of the hill for a vantage point where they saw what was described as a green circular object sitting near the lake. There were four dwarf-like beings in suits with hose pipes attached to them. They were siphoning water from the lake. The female screamed upon realizing what they were. The being scrambled into the craft and took off. On April 20, 2000, two men at Long Lac, Ontario decided to stop on the lake to gather firewood by the shore. One man decided to start a fishing hole while the other left to check the shores on a snowmobile. He returned by foot shaking and speechless, explaining that upon stopping he heard noises, like a strange language. He walked toward the sound where he saw an abandoned cabin. He went on to describe that he saw a weird object hovering above, like two stacked frisbees, and emitted a violet-colored light down on the cabin. That's when he ran back for his cousin. The two quickly made their way over, hiding behind the trees, where they saw two tall human-like creatures, taller than humans, carrying the cabin's contents into the ship. It suddenly took off. The two men decided to inspect the area. They said there was a blast crater where the object had hovered. There was me and my friend. We were hanging out at his place there. And it was probably about maybe 5.30 in the afternoon. I was standing with my back to the, his, on the his end of his deck, like facing the driveway coming in, and he was standing facing me and we were talking. He says, whoa, you know, what the hell is that? And he points up in the sky, and then I turn around. Like I said, it almost knocked me on my ass. There was this gray shift that was like, uh, it was like gray in color, and it was like floating by in the air. Like, it's going real slow to you. Like, it didn't make any noise or nothing. And it wasn't like it was flying, it was like it was floating. And the top was like, in, like a pyramid shape on the top and bottom. The rest of the thing was like uh, rectangular, I guess you can say. And it had like squared off edges. How big was it? It was about, say, 60 feet, roughly, in length. I don't know how wide it was, but you can tell it was like, like squared off or whatever, right? just the way it was. And it went, like I said, it flew from west to east. And it didn't make any noise. It was silent. And I was trying to get my cell phone, like my flipped cell phone out, trying to get it going. But I you know I was just so, ex whatever, excited or, I don't know, like freaked out I guess at the same time and I couldn't really get it going so I was running down the road and I'm like looking at this thing in the sky and I'm trying to yell around and you know, trying to get people to come outside to see, you know, what was going on. So I was just watching it, watching it. Finally I went inside the medical center and I told them, hey, you guys got to come outside and check this out. And by the time they came outside, it was like in the distance. And it was, it looked like, it was like shining, I guess from the sun shining on it maybe. It made it look metallic, almost like chrome-like. But, um, I'll never, I'll, I'll never forget it. Eh? And then you were saying that when you and compared pictures after. Yeah. Like a few days later? Yeah, a couple of days later, like, you know, I went and seen, like, seen him and talk about, like, what we saw. I went into his house and I was going to show him my picture. He already had his drawn up and he showed me, like, wow, you know, it was identical of what we've seen. I'm just curious, did you th did you report it to anybody? Like to the police or sometimes no. people do that? No, we never reported it to anybody. We just like told people and like some of the people that came out afterwards and seen it in the distance, like they asked what it was. And I told them, well, like I said, if it came out like about a minute or two earlier, you would have you seen it, eh? Then you were saying that your friend had an experience on the lake. He had a couple of friends waiting for him up at this place called the Jackfish River. And he was on his way there in his boat or whatever. And he got along this island. I don't know how far he was off the shore, say from here to that tree line over there offshore in his boat. And uh, his boat just stopped all of a sudden, you know, like it wouldn't stall on him. And he had like a full tank of gas. He was wearing like a rain pants and a raincoat. 
but it was like a, a sunny day, he said, you know, but just because of the waves riding and a, like a boat and the water splashing up on you, wanted to stay dry. So he said he was sitting there trying to start his boat, you know, he's pulling on and pulling. He said he felt like he was there for like 20 minutes. He said he's looking at the shoreline, you can see the waves crashing on the shore, you know. You can see the color of the trees, you know, it was like, you know, a day, like a sunny day. So he said he was getting mad at his boat and then he happened to look up in the sky and there was this big massive thing above him spinning like that he said. Like a big mothership or something I guess. And he said like, like, and he said when he looked at it, he said bang, he said it just sh it shot straight up in the sky and he said it was just like, this. and then he said it was just total dark out, couldn't even see the island anymore and all that. And he wasn't wearing his rain suit. Yeah, and then he said also his boat started up and then he was like, well, he was all soaking wet, he said, and he goes, where's my rain pants and my raincoat? And then I guess when he got to the river there, uh, for his buddies that were waiting for him, they said they were waiting for him for about four or five hours or something like that. But he doesn't, all he said, all he remembers is sitting there trying to start his boat that whole time. So he has missing time? Yep. He was abducted? Four he doesn't hours. recall anything like that, eh? He doesn't know if he was abducted or anything, but he must have been because... All he can remember, he said, is like he felt like he was there for like 20 minutes or something. Up there. Like, oh, on his boat. He was just working. Like, trying to get his boat going for like 20 minutes, but his buddies were waiting for him for like five hours or something when he got to where he was his destination. Yeah, when I was a kid, my grandfather said our universe that we live in is like a big giant box or like a book, he said. He said there's like Earth and our solar system and all the planets, but on every page of the book, there's our Earth and, you know, all the other planets. There's an Earth on every page, but on every page there's a different species. So we all come from Earth, but we come from a different place, a different I got dimension, I guess you can say. But we're all like, it's like a big book, he said. You turn the page, you know, there's the humans, we're here. You know, you turn the page, there's the greens. The next page of the graves. And they just come through through wormholes, eh? They just bend it. You know, a piece of paper is you can fold it and bend it. You know, you can get the, the back side to meet the front side. Well, that's how they probably come through and get here. To me, I think when your elders are telling you stuff like that, that's your heritage and that, eh? And your, you know, your, uh, your past or whatever. Like, say, like some of the legends I know, like about like nipping and all that. And, some of the stories, well, they're, I don't know how old they are, it could be like 500 years old, 1,000 years old, you know, it was just stuff handed down, like true stories and all that, eh? So his sharing of you and his conception of other life forms and the page, book page, that's something that was passed down to him. Definitely. So this like, is something that's been understood for a very long oh time. Oh yeah, you know what I mean, like, he waited, like, I didn't ever understood when I was a little kid, but as I got older, I understand now, you know, like, I never paid much attention to it when I was a kid you know, because to me it was a, just a story like some of the stories I told even like my uncles there when I grew up like they would ask me oh yeah where'd you hear this from I heard it from you know from Baba my grandfather you know your dad and they're like because you know because they weren't listening and they were told that stuff eh? you know what I mean so you know the stories I'm probably gonna tell my kids you know, you know? In the 1960s in Red Rock, Ontario, some residents recall a 40-year-old man making claim of escaping an attempted abduction from his home. Late one night, he was in his living room watching TV when a bright green light shot through his window and began to drag him from his couch. The man was pulled out through his window, but narrowly escaped by clinging onto his couch, which was too big to fit through. On June 30th, 1966, a family decided to leave Thunder Bay late one night to get an early start on fishing at nearby Onion Lake. The road was rough as it was recalled, and slow going. They made their way to the lake, where it was discovered oddly that there were no campers out they set up camp in a gravel pit beside the lake. It was about 11 o'clock p.m. and a clear night. The stars were visible, far from light pollution. As they were heading to bed, everything became eerily silent, without even a breeze on the trees. 
As they looked up in the sky, they realized the stars which glowed so brightly that night were blacked out. The sound of intermittent grinding noises was heard as the smell of carborundum rubbing on steel was described. Suddenly, their sun just disappeared into thin air right in front of them. Horrified and panicked, they began calling and searching in the darkness. After 15 minutes, the man was trying to start his truck when the child was spotted. They asked him what happened, and he claimed that he had seen a plane, saucer shaped, with red and blue lights, and went toward it. He didn't remember anything following. The truck eventually started. It has stated their son eventually lost his mind and was put in a psychiatric hospital ever since. It was also discovered that he had a brown dime-sized scar on his left ankle since that eerie night. He was 13 years old at the time of the incident. Off Highway 1117 at Hurricane, Ontario, there is a road leading to the Black Sturgeon Lake, an 80-kilometer ride. Two men were hired by the forestry sector to build a dock on the lakeshore. They had worked all week and by Friday evening had almost finished. They were to return Monday. They worked into the evening and it was decided to finish work Saturday morning rather than take the long trip back up after the weekend. It was a good idea and they made the camp for the night. It was about 2 a.m. when the two awoke without a word being uttered. They began to break up camp and started loading the truck in a more and more hurried pace. It is then that they saw something. As they shone the flashlight, there in the tall jack pines hung a creature staring them down, described as having the features of both a cat and a human. The two leapt into the truck in terror as the driver put the pedal down all the way to the highway in startled silence. It was then that they stopped and realized whatever it was had directly influenced them to get out without a word being said. With all the information set forth, what are we to make of it? Are the craft of extraterrestrial origin? It should be stated that we as a race would be self-involved and senseless to believe we are the only intelligent beings in the entirety of space. If these craft are of earthly origin, could it be that they are coming from multiverses surrounding our planet by warping both space and time, that they are hiding in plain sight? If they are in fact military craft, then it could be said that we are certainly highly intelligent and technologically advanced, and reign as masters of our own dominion with the power to share our wealth of knowledge, and yet audacious enough to destroy our own for reason of advancement of our own nations. Yet, it must be said that there are many who believe our technology is advanced only because of alien involvement, whether by recovered crashed vehicles or knowledge retrieved by those piloting advanced craft. There will always be scoffers who will turn and laugh at the concept of higher intelligence originating from beyond our world and civilization. Anything that cannot be accepted or threatens their reality must immediately be made a mockery and shoved off in lieu of staying in their comfort zone. If something doesn't fit in their safe place, it immediately is to be discarded as a fallacy worthy of public disgrace. Yet this only proves range of intelligence. It is my hope to at least make some stop and think for a moment that there is a much larger reality than our own and at least come to a conclusion that there is a possibility of life out there in the infinite expanse of space. Why would they visit us? It's possible they are concerned with our advancement of both technology and society. It should also be stated that it is likely we are not the only ones being visited. Out of all possible life in the galaxies, we are just one of many. It is not a question of, is there life out there? But when will it be discovered? As for all those who have had a variety of close encounters, the more who speak out, 
the more will come forward and finally tell their stories. Those who are seen as tough and daring outwardly are scared to death to be painted in any other light in the public eye. We all share in a brotherhood, and some, lucky enough to have witnessed such sights, are not alone in the world, and share similar experiences if only we would open up and talk. Kicking down the doors of silence is not a bad thing. It is a contribution to understanding that we are not alone, and a way of forever connecting into the human experience, even though we will never fully understand everything.